Okay. So we're going to be starting. Welcome to the seminar series on modern artificial intelligence in the NYU Tandon School of Engineering. This series begins a new tradition in New York and neighboring areas and aims to bring together faculty and students to discuss the most important research trends in the world of AI. The speakers include world-renowned experts whose research is making an immense impact on the development of new machine learning techniques and technologies and helping to build a better, smarter, more connected world. I know I don't have to convince anyone here that AI is already having an enormous impact on society. AI researchers are helping make autonomous vehicles, our defense systems stronger and the autonomous vehicles safer, our defense systems stronger and the world in general a better, smarter place. That's why it's so fitting that this new modern artificial intelligence seminar is happening here at school whose mission is to create technology that can be used for the benefit of society. NYU Tandon is fast becoming a global center of influence in the field, thanks to the entrepreneurial efforts like our AI, AI Nexus Lab, an accelerator program that supports AI-focused startup, and academic centers such as AI Now, which is bringing together experts across computer science, economics, law, academia, and other sectors, and which is, incidentally, the first AI research institute founded and led by a woman. I would like to thank Dean Katapali Srinivasan, as well as my own Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering, for hosting this series, which promises to be a significant venue for those of us working to develop new machine learning techniques and technologies. Without further ado, let me introduce our esteemed speaker and tell you a little bit about him. Jan Lecan earned a PhD in Computer Science from University Pierre Marie Curie in Paris. Following a postdoc at the University of Toronto, he joined AT&T Bell Labs, and in 1996, he became head of image processing research there. In 2013, he joined Facebook, where he is now the director of AI research. He is a member of the National Academy of Engineering, and I'm happy to say he's also affiliated with NYU Center for Data Science and Current Institute, where he's the silver processor of computer science. I'm proud to call him a colleague, and hope you will join me in welcoming him for his talk, Obstacles to Progress in Deep Learning and AI. Thank you, Anna. It's a real pleasure to be here. I'm also affiliated with, uh, with CSE, actually. It's, uh, uh, with ECE, I'm sorry, the Electrical and Computer Engineering Department here. Um, and it's always a pleasure to, uh, you know, cross the river to come here. Uh, you know, as, um, as, uh, as Anna remarked, um, the um, uh, machine learning and AI is having an increasing uh, effect on society. And uh, a, a very uh, interesting development over the last few years is that uh, NYU as a whole ha has you know, taken uh, a big role in that, uh, in that revolution and has become kind of a focal point of a lot of uh, interesting uh, things happening in that in, in, in that area, partly because of the Center for Data Science, um, you know, to which many uh, uh, members of uh, Tendon are affiliated, and uh, also because you know there's a lot of people working on deep learning and sort of the new the new AI, uh, including here at Tendon, uh, and that being one example. Um, so. Um, you know, I think there is a, a huge amount of opportunities, particularly uh, in the engineering. So my background is actually electrical engineering. I studied electrical engineering as, a, as an undergrad. Uh, my specialty was actually chip design. Um, it's very odd, but um, that's, what, that's, what I, uh, that's what I studied at school. And only later kind of shift towards, shifted towards things like uh, optimal control and then kind of led me to neural nets and AI. Um, so I view myself as, a, as an engineer as well as a scientist and uh, always um, like to build things, uh, which is really the purpose of engineering, inventing new techniques and building things. Okay, so let me start by kind of a sobering uh, comment that uh, I heard from Josh Tenenbaum, who is a cognitive uh, neuroscientist or cognitive scientist at MIT. Um, he was at a, at a conference I was at also a few months ago and he said, all those AI systems, you see nowadays, none of them is real AI. And what he means by this is that none of the AI systems that we have today can match 
the ability of biological systems, um, animals and humans to, to learn you know, how to deal, how to survive, deal, deal with the uh, variability of data in the world. So we can do a lot with current techniques, but we're very far from uh, really sort of reaching the goal of uh, making machines really intelligent. And so the first uh, part of my talk is going to be a bit of a state of the art and a little bit of history as well. And the second part is going to be about the challenges uh, of the, the future. And I think um, areas like robotics have a big important role to play there because that's where the important problems pop up. So I'll come to this in a minute. Okay, so AI today really is uh, supervised learning. Uh, what supervised learning means is that you have a... Uh, uh, this is generally school, so I use an analog synthesizer as a model for a learning machine. Um, it's a, uh, a learning machine really is a parameterized function. You show it an image, and you, you know, run the calculation through it, and it produces an output. If the output is what you want, you don't do anything. If the output is not what you want, you tell the machine, here is what the correct output is. And what it does is it figures out how to adjust its parameters so that next time around it sees the same input, uh, the output gets closer to what you want. Okay, so let's say you want to classify cars from images of cars from images of airplanes. Um, you know, show an image of a car, and the machine doesn't say car, it just, you know, adjusts all the knobs, uh, you know, of which there could be millions, uh, so that the output gets closer to what you want. And the interesting, about, interesting thing about this is that if you build a machine in such a way that it has enough uh, power, if you want, um, the machine will eventually figure out what the concept behind a car and an airplane is, and, and kind of will be able to classify any car and any airplane, um, you know, including if there is a lot of variability. You know, the example of chairs here, where there's a huge amount of variability between the appearance of chairs. Um, and the reason why that, that is, is because of the, essentially the appearance of deep learning over the last, uh, or the popularization of deep learning over the last 10 years or so, even though work, work on this started about 30 years ago, um, and restarted more recently about 15 years ago, uh, the, the world kind of started learning about this, you know, about seven years ago or so, not even that. So classically, when you wanted to do pattern recognition, you would uh, feed the image to a feature extractor that would generally be built by hand, and then you would uh, plug a trainable classifier on top of it. So those kind of uh, rose uh, painted, pink painted uh, uh, boxes are supposed to mean that they are adaptable, that you can be trained. All right, so the top, uh, at the top is kind of the classical model of pattern recognition, and it's used still very, very much in a lot of uh, practical applications of, uh, of machine learning today. At the bottom is kind of the deep learning model, and the idea of deep learning is that you, you, you build your model as kind of a stack of adaptable, trainable, parameterized modules, and you train the entire system end-to-end -end, so as to minimize some objective function that measures the discrepancy between what you want and what you get. Uh, but the point is the entire system is trainable and that allows it to kind of uh, process the data in sort of a hierarchical way and I'll come, I'll come to why that's a good idea. So the next question you have to ask is what do you put in those boxes? And it's deceptively simple. Um, essentially a simple neural net is a succession of such boxes and there are really two types. One type is just a linear operation, right? So imagine uh, a, a text, an image, or an audio signal is coded into a vector you take this vector multiplied by a matrix, you get another vector, possibly of a different size. Okay, that's a linear operator. Um, and the coefficients in this linear operator are going to be the knobs that we're going to adjust by, by learning. Um, so that produces another vector. You could think of each component of this vector as being a weighted sum of the component of the input vector weighted by the corresponding row in the matrix by which you, you multiply this vector. Then the second operation is a pointwise nonlinearity. And in recent incarnations of neural nets, very often this pointwise nonlinearity is the one shown on the top, the top right. It's called a ReLU. It's really halfway rectification. Uh, the nice thing about uh, talking to engineers is that I don't have to explain what halfway rectification is. Um, not so for computer scientists. Um, so you have linear operation, pointwise nonlinearities, uh, which are you know very simple, and then you stack. Uh, multiple stages of these pairs of operations, linear, nonlinear, linear, nonlinear. You can show that with only two layers of these, so linear, nonlinear, linear, you can approximate any function you want as close as you want, as long as the middle layer is large enough, okay? And that's uh, something that people have relied on for many years. 
arguing for the fact that you never need more than two layers because you can appro approximate any function you want with two layers. That actually is not entirely true because for most functions you want to compute, the middle layer might need to be extremely large. And so classical models like, or what has become classical models like say kernel machines, support vector machines, things like this, are limited to two layers. In fact, only the second layer is really adaptive. And that's what limits their power, is the fact that they can only ha do basically two steps of computation and one nonlinear step of computation. So it turns out there's a lot of interesting functions that require multiple nonlinear steps of computation, and that's why deep learning is really interesting. And it's very difficult to kind of turn this into a theorem and sort of have some theory about why you need multiple layers, but intuitively it makes complete sense. Most functions require multiple steps. Computer scientists know this, right? It's very rare that you can write a program to compute a function that will only require two instructions, right? Generally, you have loops, you have things like that, right? Um, okay, so training, supervised learning really uh, comes down to minimizing an objective function. You show an example to the system, uh, compute the output, compare with the output you want. That gives you a value for the cost function, the objective you want to minimize, the error between the, what you want and what you get. Uh, adjust the parameters a little bit, then show another sample. Adjust the parameters a little bit, then show another sample, et cetera, et cetera. And if you do this, uh, what you're doing in effect is what's called a stochastic gradient uh, optimization algorithm, uh, shown at the, at the bottom, where you basically replace each parameter by its own value minus the partial derivative of the loss function you want to minimize uh, with respect to this particular parameter multiplied by some constant, um, the step size, and because you do it on the basis of a single sample, that's called stochastic gradient, because you get an estimate of that, the gradient of the objective. Really, the objective you want to minimize is the average of all the samples, but because you do it one sample at a time, uh, you get a noisy estimate every time. Or you do it a, with a, a small batch of samples at a time, you get a noisy estimate, so it's called stochastic gradient for that reason. And so, uh, uh, pictorially, you can think of the cost function as being you know, some sort of landscape in a high-dimensional space. And what this algorithm does is kind of find the minimum of that, uh, you know, the valley, uh, the bottom of the valley and that landscape, but kind of stochastically, stochastically, every time being given kind of a noisy estimate of the direction of steepest descent. Um, so next question you might ask is how do you compute this gradient? And uh, there's the so-called backpropagation algorithm, which I'm not gonna go through because um, it would take too, too long, and many of you, I'm sure, know about it. It's basically based on chain rules. So it says, if you, ha if you know, um, you know your, net your network is basically a, a graph of computational nodes, and you know how to compute the output of each, of each node, of computational blocks here in this case, you know how to compute the output of each block as a function of its inputs and its internal parameters. And it turns out if you know the gradient of the loss function with respect to the output of that module, you only need to multiply by the Jacobian matrix of that uh, module with respect to its input or with respect to its parameters to get the gradient with respect to the input with respect to the parameters. So that gives you uh, a suggestion that you can have some sort of recursive algorithm that goes backwards you know, uh, through the graph and kind of propagates gradients this way. And it's called the backpropagation algorithm. It's basically just chain rule. But it turns out you know, if you express it graphically, you, you express your system as a graph of networks, um, you don't have to figure out how to compute the gradient. As long as your system knows how to compute the gradient for each module, you can assemble very complex networks and not worry about how to compute the gradient. That will be done automatically by the software you use. So all the deep learning framework, basically what they do for you is they allow you to build a graph of those networks and then they automatically compute the gradient for you. Okay, so linear operators are good, but if you have an image, an image might have you know, a million pixels, uh, and uh, you know, if you multiply an image of a million pixels by a matrix, and the output is also a million variables, let's say, that's a big matrix, right? 10 to the 12 terms. So what we need to do is essentially reduce, uh, you know, put some constraints on this matrix so that it becomes manageable. And convolutional nets, uh, which are used somewhat universally now for image recognition, as well as for all kinds of other applications like speech and even text, translation, things like this, are the main idea behind that is to basically constrain the matrices so that they're basically two-piece matrices and that they can uh, uh, you know, have fewer parameters and reduce the amount of computation. Um, so again, the nice thing about talking to electrical engineers is that I don't have to explain what convolution is, but, um, uh, but b the basic idea of a convolutional net is you, you take an image and you uh, take a, a neighborhood of pixels 
and you have a set of coefficients that you multiply this uh, little patch of pixels by, and that gives you a weighted sum. Okay, that's one term in, in the output. So that gives you one uh, output value, and then you swipe that, that uh, little window of pixels over the entire image, and every time you compute the dot product with the, the coefficients and record the results. So that's a discrete 2D convolution. And you get the, you know, if the input is here at the bottom, uh, the bottom right, you see the, the little convolution kernels, uh, the set of coefficients, and you see the result here, that's called a feature map. Then you pass the result to a nonlinearity, say a ReLU or a sigmoid or something like that. So at the bottom, here on the, on the top left, you see the image, then you see the f four feature maps that are the result of convolving the image with four different kernels. And the coefficients of those kernels are the result of learning, right? They're learned with, with backpropagation all the way through. And then there's a second operation called pooling, um, which consists in sort of uh, aggregating the response of the filter over a small area by a max or an average or a L2 norm or something like this, uh, and then reducing the resolution. And the reason for this is to uh, impose a little bit of shift and distortion invariance in the system. And this is very much inspired by biology. You know, we talk about convolutions and invariance and blah, 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 but in fact, the architecture of this is completely uh, suggested by the architecture of the visual cortex, this classic work in the 60s, um, uh, in fact, Nobel Prize winning work by Hubel and Wiesel about the architecture of the visual cortex, where, where they showed that neurons in the visual cortex of cats look at local areas in the visual field and, um, and are basically repeated all over the, the visual field. Uh, so that's where the idea, the idea comes from, and there were models uh, that tried to emulate this you know, back in the 80s, uh, Fukushima's neuroconeutron, for example. Um, so um, uh, neuroscientists call these simple cells and complex cells, the, 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 the sort of convolution-like operation and the, the pooling. So here is a, a convolutional net in action. Um, the, and, you know, each vertical uh, column is a, is a different layer. You, you see the input on the, on the left. And... You know, if the input shifts by four pixels, then the, the third layer after pooling shifts by two pixels because it's subsampled by a factor of two. And then the, you know, two layers up, it's shifted by one pixel. And then a couple layers up by maybe one half pixel or something like that. So as you go up the layers, the amount of distortions caused by a shift in the image or distortion in the image is reduced and is easier to model, which is why those systems kind of are more amenable to do uh, to doing image recognition or kind of invariant, somewhat invariant recognition. So that seems like an obvious concept, but um, but back in the 90s, uh, very few people were convinced this was uh, this was a good idea. Uh, so, for example, this is uh, a picture uh, taken in 2005, which was the dinner um, um, resulting from a bet between Larry Jackal sitting on the right and Vladimir Vapnik, who is uh, in the back here, whom I think you will hear talk at this seminar in a few weeks. Um, so he's a former colleague of mine at Bell Labs. And the bet, uh, Larry Jackal was the head of the department at the time, and Jackal bet one fancy dinner that by March 14, 2000, this was in 1995, people will understand quantitatively why big neural networks working on large data sets are not so bad. Uh, Understanding means that there will be clear conditions and bounds and things like this, the kind of uh, theoretical uh, arguments that uh, uh, Vatnik likes. Vatnik bets, bets one fancy dinner that Jekyll is wrong. But if Vatnik figures out the bound condi and conditions, Vatnik still wins the bet. So this was a thinly veiled uh, attempt by Jekyll to convince Vatnik that he should do the theory for neural nets. Uh, he completely failed. And, um, and he also lost the bet because we still don't quite understand really the kind of the generalization properties of neural nets. I mean, we understand they work, you know, there's no problem with this, but, uh, but not to the same extent as simpler models, just because, you know, they're, they're much more complicated. And so we don't have simple theory for it. We have theories, but they're not that useful. Um, there's a second bet. Vatnik bets one fancy dinner that by March 14, 2005, no one in his right mind will use neural nets that are essentially like those used in 1995. Jekyll bets one fancy dinner that Vapnik is wrong. So Jekyll lost the first one, Vapnik lost the second one. And so in 2005, there was a, there was a dinner, and they shared the bill. And, <laughs> and Leon Boutou and I, Leon Boutou is the, the man on the left here, uh, Leon Boutou and I just enjoyed the dinner. Um, okay, so, um, 
you know, since uh, there's quite a few people here, I see fortunately here the first uh, row work, uh, working on robotics here. I thought I'd work a little bit on, uh, talk a little bit about some robotics project that we did. And this is a little historical going back, uh, you know, about 10 years, even more. Um, the end of the project was about 10 years ago. This was a project called Lagger, Learning Applied to Ground Robots, uh, sponsored by DARPA. And the idea was to use machine learning to drive robots of the type you see on the top left uh, off-road. So the system would, should be able to, you know, through vision, kind of figure out what's an obstacle and what's not. And you can do this with uh, stereo vision for short range, but it doesn't really work with long range because with stereo vision, you can only, you know, depending on the baseline of the two cameras, you, you can only figure out if something sticks out of the ground about 10 meters out, but not much more than that. So what you see here in the middle uh, column are the results of applying stereo vision to, uh, to this. And you know, it stops after 10, 15 meters. Uh, whereas if you apply the neural net, um, it's monocular, so it works all the way. And the cool thing about this is that you can train the neural net with the data produced by the stereo vision system. So you don't have to explicitly supervise it. You basically let the robot run, collect data from, from stereo vision, and then use that to train the monocular system to tell you whether something is an obstacle or not. Um, and so it was a, a convolutional net, which, uh, you know, the idea of, of this was that you would apply the convolutional net basically on small patches uh, over the entire image, and it would classify every pixel if you want. So it's a, a, a task in computer vision that, that we call semantic segmentation, which consists in categorizing every pixel in the image by the category of the object it belongs to. Um, so this was running on, this was a, you know, robot uh, built by um, NREC uh, at CMU, uh, uh, around 2005, and so the processors were not what they are now, no, no GPU or anything. So we could run the neural net at about one frame per second. So we had a short range stereo vision system for kind of avoiding uh, unexpected obstacles, and, and then the long range vision system would, uh, would run at about one, uh, one hertz. And so this is the robot. The video is accelerated twice. <laughs> and these are annoying PhD students making the life of this poor robot impossible. Um, but they are allowed to do that because they actually wrote the code. Um, <laughs> and this is uh, Pierre Samane, who is uh, now uh, working on robotics at Google Brain in California, and Ryan Hetzel, who leads the robotics research group at DeepMind in London. Um, so after this, we uh, decided that we could do semantic segmentation for real. So instead of, uh, whoops, I'm not sure why, my slides are shifting without me telling it, but um, anyway. So we decided that we would um, uh, work on semantic segmentation for real and uh, essentially have a system that labels every pixel in an image, not as to whether it's traversable or not, but, but with the category of the object it belongs to. So you have an image like this, and you'd like to be able to tell whether it's the road or a car or a building or the sky or trees or whatever, or pedestrians, that kind of important. And so eventually we, uh, we built such a system. It's a, again a commercial net kind of swiped over the entire image. You can run this very efficiently. Uh, we, uh, with uh, Clément Ferrabé, who is now the VP of uh, uh, machine learning uh, uh, services at uh, NVIDIA, uh, he implemented an FPGA board that ran this system at about 20 frames per second. And this is kind of a, a demo of this. This is uh, state of the art at the time. Uh, down Washington Square Park, some of you might recognize. Um, this is Washington S uh, Square Park. So it's making stupid mistakes, like it's, it's classifying, you know, some areas of Washington Square Park as desert or beach. There is no beach I'm aware of there, but um, uh, it would certainly make the campus more attractive. Um, so you know, it, it's not perfect, and since then, uh, those technologies based also on conventional nets have made a huge amount of progress, but you know, this was 2010, roughly. And we could run this at 20 frames per second. So I gave various talks about this around the, that time. And it gave some ideas to people working on self-driving cars. They said they realized perhaps they could use this for self-driving cars. So in particular, there's a company uh, called Mobileye um, in Israel that was working on vision systems for, for cars, uh, uh, created by Anon Shashua, who was a professor of computer vision at uh, Hebrew University. And they started playing with conventional nets and were getting much better results than with whatever technique they were using before. And they had a problem because the chip they had designed wasn't really designed to run conventional nets. So they kind of had to shoehorn uh, conventional nets onto their current chip. Now they have new chips that, that do differently. 
but it, it went uh, it, it worked well enough that uh, the, the the Tesla cars that uh, appeared in 2005 2015 2014 15 actually used their chip for autonomous driving um, after that they divorced for various reasons um, that also prompted Nvidia who builds the GPU cars to get into the, the business of self-driving cars because they realized you know they could you know build a hardware for this and they also realized that they couldn't just sell the hardware they had to uh, build software on top of it. In fact, one team that does research on self-driving cars uh, at NVIDIA is, uh, uh, it, you know, former colleagues of mine from Bell Labs and works in Holdout, New Jersey, the same building where I used to work at Bell Labs, and they, they're doing pretty amazing stuff there, and uh, Anna's husband actually works there too. Um, okay, so what happened in 2012-13 is that um, people figured out, I mean, first of all, there was you know, much bigger data sets that became available, like ImageNet uh, for, for image recognition. So ImageNet is a data set with 1.3 million training samples. It's got 1,000 categories of objects you know, that are sort of a dominant object in the picture. And this is the kind of data where commercial nets really shine. Before that, the data sets were so small that you know, techniques that built more things by hand were actually more successful than, than commercial nets. You couldn't really get kind of you know, record-beating performance with commercial nets uh, before that. But large with large data sets, that really kind of uh, blew everything out of the water. And the, uh, the second reason was the efficient implementations of commercial nets on GPUs, which allowed us to build much, much bigger uh, commercial nets. So um, the work by our friends at University of Toronto, Alex Kujewski, Ilya Sutskever, and uh, Jeff Hinton, uh, really kind of opened the eyes of the computer vision community on this and sort of created a kind of a revolution, which is funny because uh, in 2011, we submitted a paper on this semantic segmentation to CVPR, and it was rejected, uh, mostly because people had no idea what the convolutional net was, the reviewers, and they didn't believe that uh, technology that they never heard of could work so well. Um, three years later, maybe three, four years later, 2015, 14, uh, you cannot get a paper accepted as CVPR unless you use convolutional nets. So, uh, you know, it's been a, a big revolution. Now, what's happened uh, over the over the last few years is that so many people got interested in this that they all came up with really cool ideas, new architectural ideas uh, on how you kind of assemble those functional blocks into uh, in various ways. And the the latest uh, architectures of uh, convolutional nets for image recognition have something like 50 layers or 100 layers. Uh, they use this idea called ResNet, uh, uh, originally. Um, proposed by Kaming, Kaming He from uh, Microsoft Research Asia. He now works at Facebook in California. And uh, they, you know, it, it kind of, uh, this evolution uh, has led to incredible impro improvements in uh, recognition rates. So on ImageNet, for example, before convolutional nets, the best error rates were around 25, 26%. Uh, this is, you count an error when the correct category is not in the top five among the 1,000. Uh, then one year later, the Krzyzewski paper brought this down to about 15. One year later, it was around 10. One year later, it was around five. Now it's below three. And that's superhuman. So if you ask people to categorize those images, they'll make just about as many mistakes. And most of those are images that are ambiguous in, you know, in the first place. You don't know what the relevant object is. Uh, so one question we might ask is, why is it that makes convolutional nets and those hierarchical multilayer structures actually good? And uh, in my opinion, it's probably because they reflect the compositionality of the real world. So the real world, particularly the, the perceptual world, is compositional in the sense that an object is formed of parts, and parts are formed of motifs, and motifs are formed of collection of edges. And so if you have at the low level a sort of oriented edge detector, which is what those convolutional nets end up learning and what your brain is doing, uh, and what every, actually, even handcrafted uh, computer vision system will do, um, then you can detect combinations of those edges to detect uh, uh, you know, common shapes like corners, circles, grating, things like this. And then those uh, assemble to form parts of objects. So you de detect combinations of those. And that's kind of what this architecture of convolutional net reflects with a pooling operation that allows the position of those little features to kind of vary a little bit. And so you get this sort of elastic perception. Um, and so, it, you know, it, it sounds like a conspiracy that the world is so designed that it's easily understandable by architectures that happen to uh, fit in our brain case, um, which led uh, Stu Giemann, who's a 
applied mathematician at Brown to say the world is compositional or there is a God. Um, this is kind of a play on uh, something that uh, uh, Albert Einstein said, um, that he said that the most incomprehensible about the world is that it's comprehensible. Um, the world could be completely random and there was no way we could make any sense out of it. And so it seems like a conspiracy that there is you know, some understanding we can have of it. Um, okay, so um, moving on to uh, you know, slightly more recent work. Uh, this is a little bit of a snapshot of state of the art of what people can do in computer vision. And this is some work done at the uh, Physical Care Research in, uh, in California, in Menlo Park, a technique called MASK RCNN. And this is, again, a, sort of a semantic segmentation system, but it doesn't just label each pixel with a category, it, it labels it with the instance of the object. Um, and it gives you a mask for the, uh, for the object. So I'm not going to go into the details of this architecture, but it's uh, conceptually quite simple. And you can do things like this. So it will, uh, you know, again, it's kind of a sliding window convolutional net. It looks at multiple scales, and it, you know, it kind of focuses on different areas. And the output is not just a category for the for the pixel in, in question. It's also a mask of the object that it believes it's looking at. Okay, for every location. So you put this together, and you get, uh, you know, a mask for every object uh, in the picture. The uh, visible bat, the dog at the bottom, the people, etc. There are individual people. Uh, you know, the wine glasses, the wine bottle, the computers in the back, the table. You can count the sheets, um, uh, etc. I mean, it works amazingly well. And this is, uh, in my opinion, really one of the most kind of impressive uh, progress of the last few years in computer vision, showing what people can do with this. You know, we can track. Uh, um, key points on, on bodies and sort of reconstruct the, the pose. So this, uh, this is the latest result. This code is open source, by the way. Um, so if you go to this uh, URL, you can just download the code, play with it. You can you know, train it to your own purpose. Uh, it's, uh, it's all C++. It's pretty cool. Uh, you can apply convolutional nets to 3D data. Uh, this is some pictures from uh, also a semantic segmentation uh, competition, actually. Uh, run by uh, Stanford, I believe, where a team from uh, Facebook in Paris actually won that competition using 3D convolutional nets. And the problem with 3D is that when you have uh, an occupancy, occupancy map or um, a point cloud of uh, 3D points uh, from LiDAR, for example, or a depth sensor, most of the voxels are empty. And so if you run a convolutional net on the entire volume, you kind of waste your time just multiplying zeros with, uh, you know, with other numbers. So they figured out a way to kind of just follow the areas where there is voxels that are non-empty and, um, and they, you know, thereby kind of increasing the efficiency and they, they got really good results with that. In fact, they won the, the competition. Um, just, to, just to show that convolutional nets can be used for something else than pixels, the, one of the systems that Facebook uses for translating languages uh, from one language to another uh, is actually a convolutional net. It's a gated convolutional net, so it's a little more complicated than traditional convolutional nets. The architecture is, is shown on the right. I'm not going to go through it, but it basically uh, takes every word as a vector, essentially, and it learns the mapping from words to vector as well. And then that goes to a convolutional net, and then this convolutional net uh, has some gating mechanism that can sort of, uh, you know, regurgitate words in a different language in the right order. So if you translate, you know, uh, English to German, uh, you remember to put the word, verb at the end and stuff like that. Um, so it's, uh, it's interesting that something that was designed for perception and vision can actually be used for you know, producing sequences and, uh, that are not you know, pixels. Uh, but but you know, text has a common property with images, which is that there's kind of local correlations, right? The, you know, the one word can follow another, and there's some correlation between neighboring words, but faraway words are less correlated, so it's kind of like pixels and images. Now, a lot of things that, that uh, we do at Facebook, and you know, I, I wear two hats. I have you know, one foot at NYU, one foot at Facebook, or I should say one and a half foot at Facebook and one half foot at NYU, um, is, uh, is that uh, all the research we do is, uh, is open. We publish everything, and we uh, distribute a lot of uh, uh, code in open source. So uh, the, the one that's probably the most useful at the moment is PyTorch, which uh, is a framework for deep learning. It is very flexible. Um, and it would be nice if my uh, laptop didn't die. Okay. 
Apologies. All right. Okay. Now, deep learning is this idea of assembling uh, modules in kind of a fixed graph. But really, what people are moving to is something uh, some of us would call differentiable programming. And the idea there is that you don't want this graph of operators to be fixed. You want it to be defined by program. And uh, you might want it to be dependent upon the, t the input you're looking at. So for every new input you're seeing, the architecture of the graph will change. And so why is it called differentiable programming? It's because uh, basically, you write a program that computes the outputs, and this program uh, calls functions that could be the equivalent of those uh, modules, functional modules I, to I told you about. Uh, and there is, you know, in the background, something that figures out how to basically backpropagate gradients through your program. So that whatever program you write, uh, whatever, or I should say subgradient for the mathematicians in the room, because a lot of those functions are not entirely differentiable. Um, so let's call it subgradient and be done with that. Um, uh, so, but, but the idea that, um, you know, the, 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 the program is data dependent and, you know, builds the graph dynamically and you can still propagate gradient through it. Uh, so let's call this differentiable programming. You could think of this as a slight generalization of, uh, of deep learning the same way probabilistic programming is a generalization of probabilistic graphical models, for example. And people are interested in this, particularly in the, in the context of natural language processing or reasoning because we think that's kind of required for certain types of reasoning. So an example of this is uh, neural nets that are augmented by modules that basically act as a scratch pad memory, like a RAM, if you want. And so that's a kind of a, a concept that popped up in a, a few years ago with the memory network uh, idea by uh, Jason Weston, who is at, uh, at Facebook, um, stack augmented uh, RNNs or by Julian Nikolov, also at Facebook. Uh, neural Turing machines and differentiable neural computers by uh, Graves et al. from DeepMind. Those, those ideas kind of popped up all, more or less all at the same time, uh, within days of each other on archive, which is funny. Um, and um, the, basic, the basic idea is that you have a recurrent neural net, so a neural net that can feed its, input, its output back to its input if you want, uh, so it can have some dynamics. And it's, you know, accessing a memory on the side. So a memory is just a different type of set of modules that uh, behave in a particular way. And this, you know, again, several architectures, which I'm not going to go into the details of, but just talk about this idea of differentiable memory. So think of the a circuit uh, of, of a, RAM, a RAM chip, OK? A RAM chip has uh, an address decoder, which basically compares the input address with all 2 to the n uh, possible bit configurations and activates one line in the, in the chip memory. And then what you read out is the, the sum, the weighted sum of all the memories, except all the weights are zero, except the, for the one that whose you know, row is, is addressed. So the differentiable uh, memory used in those memory networks is exactly the same idea. The input is a vector. You compute the dot product of this vector with a bunch of uh, key vectors, which are like the, that's like the address decoder. So the dot product gives you, you know, how well the input vector matches each of those keys. Um, you get a bunch of numbers, correspond to those dot products. You run that through a softmax, which turns this into a bunch of numbers between 0 and 1 that sum to 1. Uh, it's kind of like a Gibbs distribution. The formula is on, is on the left. And then you use those coefficients to, uh, uh, add, you know, in a weighted sum of, of values, which themselves are vectors, uh, produced by the memory. So what you get is a weighted sum of the values in the memory weighted by those coefficients resulting from the dot product of the input address with each of the keys. Um, so it's kind of a you know, soft associative memory, if you want. And the cool thing is that you can pr propagate gradient through that. You can learn the keys. You can learn the values, um, et cetera. So you can build a neural net. So this is kind of a recurrent neural net unfolded in time, which accesses this memory three times in this case, if you look at the, the right part of the picture here. Uh, so you get, a, for example, you want to build a system to answer questions. You put a question at the input, which is really encoded as a vector. And then the system sort of computes an address, accesses the memory to see if the answer is there, uh, then gets the, gets the answer, runs the recurrent net once or twice, then accesses the memory again, runs the recurrent net, accesses once or twice, etc. And that would allow the system to basically access the memory multiple times if it needs to 
connect multiple facts to answer a particular question. Um, so my colleagues at Facebook came up with this uh, thing called the Babi task. You can, it's kind of hard to read, but uh, in the middle at the top, there is uh, something, a little story. Sam walks into the kitchen. Sam picks up an apple. Sam walks into the bedroom. Sam drops the apple. Where is the apple? And the answer is in the bedroom. So you have to kind of track, you know, what goes on, etc. You have to make simple inference. Brian is a lion. Julius is a lion. Julius is white. Bernard is green. Rockwell is Brian. If you assume all lions are white, uh, Brian is white. So um, they came up with 20 different types of questions of this type that people might want to answer and, uh, or, or you know, might want machines to answer. Uh, and uh, training a memory network to answer those questions, they, they can basically solve 20, 19 of the 20 types. Uh, there's another type of uh, network called uh, uh, entity network that can solve all 20 that we came up with more recently, but um, which I'm not going to go into. Uh, it's very similar. It's also kind of a memory augmented neural net. So that's really nice because that's the idea of kind of marrying reasoning with, with, uh, with learning. And reasoning is something traditional AI was very strong at. So traditional AI, you know, expert systems, rule-based systems, this is basically completely concentrated on the, the whole idea of doing reasoning properly. But then there's the problem of, of knowledge acquisition. How do you feed the machine with enough knowledge to reason properly? And that was always the main problem, the main, the main issue with expert systems. It's how much effort it takes to actually reduce everything to rules, et cetera. So what, what you'd like is machines to be able to reason, but at the same time learn uh, how, to, how to do that and learn facts. Here's another example, uh, also done at Facebook in uh, Menlo Park uh, by uh, Justin Johnson, who was at the time an, uh, an intern, and a whole bunch of characters uh, from Facebook. And uh, here the problem is to answer questions like, um, you know, the, the, the picture at, um, at the bottom here, uh, is there a matte cube that has the same size as a red metal object? Um, so to be able to answer questions like this, you're going to have to you know, count the number of objects of a particular type, detect them first, etc. cetera. Um, so they came up with this architecture, and people since then have come up with uh, even better ways of doing this, but the idea is a little similar. So imagine you have a question that the system needs to answer, something like, are there more cubes than yellow things? So you take the image, you run a conventional net on it, which, you know, we're going to train through this whole system. Then what you'd like is you'd like a little, blo a little block, uh, one of those green blocks here, that uh, filters uh, colors, another one that filters by shape, and detects cubes. The first one filters the yellow objects. Then there is a block that counts those objects. Then there's a block that compares those two numbers, and you get the answer to your question. The problem is, it's one of those examples where this graph of operators needs to be dynamic. You know, it needs to be determined by the data. Um, and so what they have here on the left is the question goes into a recurrent neural net that then spits out a specification for a graph, essentially. Um, it, you know, it's a kind of a tree type, uh, I mean, a, a sort of a graph-like uh, syntax that specifies a graph. And uh, it's, it's kind of hard to backpropagate to this operation. More recent work on this have, uh, by, by others, by Erwin Corville at the uh, University of Montreal, for example, have done this in a fully differentiable way. So here there is uh, a bit of hocus pocus you have to do to train this uh, system end to end. But uh, the wonderful thing is that the only way you have to train the system is you, you give it a question, you give it an image, you give it the answer, and uh, it basically figures out how to kind of organize all this. Uh, it needs a little bit of prompting at the beginning to tell it what the graph looks like for a few examples. Uh, but it, it's able to generalize pretty well. So that's one of those uh, kind of really eye-opening examples where uh, you can have essentially a neural net producing another neural net dynamically and then have this neural net solve a particular problem. And it seems like, it, it sounds intuitive that, that we might have something like this in our, head, in our head, right? We face a new situation, we kind of configure our you know, reasoning engine to kind of figure out, you know, analyze the current situation. Uh, let me uh, skip ahead a little bit. Uh, when I'm skipping ahead, I have to apologize to Anna because it's uh, work that uh, she and I did together a few years ago. Uh, but I want to get to um, obstacles to AI. So. Um, as I said before, animals and humans learn much more efficiently, efficiently than, uh, than all the machines that we have. Um, and, you know, why, one may wonder what kind of learning algorithm does the brain use? 
or what kind of principle, what kind of paradigm. You know, it may, it may not be just a question of algorithm. And one thing that uh, humans and animals uh, seem to have is some sort of common sensibility, right? The, the fact that we, we kind of know how the world works, and so we can fill in the blanks for a lot of things. We don't have to be told everything. Uh, you know, uh, right now, you're, most of you are seeing my left profile, but you can figure out what my right profile looks like because you know that faces are mostly symmetric. Um, uh, you know, you have a blind spot in your visual field uh, where your optical nerve punctures through your retina and you're not even conscious of it because your brain kind of fills it up. Um, you know, we have a very good ability to predict uh, the future and predict the consequences of our actions. That's what allows us to plan ahead. In fact, you could say because of this that uh, the essence of intelligence is really the ability to predict. It's the ability to build models of the world, right, by learning, by observation, by interaction. So perhaps what we need our machines to do is this kind of predictive learning. Um, it's, it's a little... I, the phrase here is not exactly, does not exactly reflect uh, what, what it means. Uh, perhaps a better name would be imputative learning, but that sounds a little pedantic. Um, so it's basically the idea that uh, the system should learn to predict every variable it doesn't currently observe uh, from all the variables that it currently observes. So we'll predict the future from the, from the present and the past, uh, predict all the things you can't directly observe right now, but you might observe by uh, you know, moving your head. So right now, some objects are, uh, you know, the front of the stage is hidden behind the lectern, but, you know, I can move and figure out what it looks like. So I can sort of, you know, train my brain to predict um, what it looks like and, and, and see what it is. Um, my brain certainly can predict what the view is going gonna, is gonna to look like if I shift my head 20 centimeters to the right. And in the process of learning how to do this, uh, we probably developed the notion of uh, depth, right? So depth can be learned naturally by predicting how the world changes when you move your head. Or if you look, look at the world with two eyes also. But even if you had one eye, it would, it would still work. Um, and so, you know, we, we, uh, we, we learn this as babies, right? We, uh, we look at the world. We can hardly act on the world when we were babies. But we learn a huge amount of stuff about the world just by observation. We, we, you know, we learn object permanence. We learn, you know, intuitive physics. Um, you know, baby orangutans also learn things. Here is a baby orangutan. It's playing, you know, it's being played a magic trick. Put an object in a cup. Remove the object without him seeing, and then show him the empty cup. And he's rolling on the floor laughing. <laughs> <laughs> That's a baby orangutan. They are also almost as smart as we are. Um, you know, if uh, you know, if in my lifetime we could build machines that were, you know, just a little bit, you know, as smart as orangutans, that would be complete success. In fact, I think if they were as intelligent as a house cat, I think it would be complete success. Um, you know, so if you show the the picture on the top left to a baby, the, I stole this from uh, Emmanuel Dupou, who um, is a cognitive uh, uh, scientist in in Paris, and if you show uh, the six-month baby or you know, four-month baby, uh, the, the scenario on the left here, you push a little cart off of a, a support and it floats in the air. Of course, there's a trick. Um, BB said, sure, that's the way the world works, no problem. After six or eight months, they figured out what gravity is, and they look at this like this, like the baby on the bottom left. They're completely surprised by this because they figured that can't possibly happen. Every object is not supported, should fall. Um, so in fact, Emmanuel uh, built this chart of w at what age babies learn sort of different concepts, uh, like object permanence, uh, the fact that there are animate and inanimate objects, that's about two months, three months, uh, stability and support, about five months, gravity, inertia, conservation of momentum, that's about eight months, you know, things like that. So, you know, the object rigidity, things like that. So basic, you know, concepts about how the world works uh, are, are learned in the first few months of life, mostly by observation with very little interaction with the world. And we don't know how to do this with machines, but that's what we should do. Um, so that led me to this, uh, uh, you know, there is those three modes of learning that people use in the context of machine learning. One is called reinforcement learning. So reinforcement learning is when uh, you get the machine to do something, you don't tell it what the correct answer is, you just tell it you did good, you did bad, right? You give it one scalar uh, reward or, you know, feedback once in a while. 
Uh, and it could be at the end of a long sequence of actions, which makes the whole thing very difficult. Uh, the supervised running, where you tell the machine what the correct answer is. Uh, we already talked about this. And then this kind of other modes of learning, which generally we can call unsupervised running, but really that doesn't really tell uh, what we do, but maybe predictive learning, that where the machine learns to predict every variable it doesn't currently observe from the ones it does observe. Uh, and in that, that form, there's a huge amount of feedback that the machine gets, right? If I, if, I predict, if I try to predict what the world looks like when I move my head, and I do move my head, the amount of feedback I get is all the pixels in the world. It's not just one scalar value once in a while. It's all the pixels in the world. So it's a huge amount of information that the machine gets. And that's, according to various people like Jeff Hinton, this is the only way we can train very, very powerful learning machines to learn anything about the world, is, is if we give them a huge amount of feedback every time we train them. So that led me to this uh, slightly obnoxious uh, slide that I show every time now because it's become a meme in the machine learning community, where uh, if intelligence is a cake, the bulk of the cake, the genoise, if you want, is uh, unsupervised or predictive learning, and then the, in terms of the amount of feedback you give to the machine, the uh, you know, icing on the cake is supervised learning, and the cherry on the cake is uh, reinforcement learning because you're only giving a very small amount of feedback, classical reinforcement learning. And that's... That's why you know, classical reinforcement learning doesn't uh, apply to the real world. The world. It works really well for things like Go and chess and things like this, but for the real world, if you want to learn to drive a car and you have to drive the car off a cliff 50,000 times before the machine learns not to drive the car off the cliff, you know, we seem to be able to do much better than this. Because, why? Because we have a model of the world that allows us to predict what's going to happen if we run off a cliff. So we don't actually run off the cliff. We don't need to do this to predict what's going to happen. Our model of the world is good enough to prevent us from doing this. Um, so what reinforcement learning systems need to have is a model of the world. They need to learn a model of the world. And that's called model-based RL. But model-based learning in general is not just limited to reinforcement learning. It's, it you know, applies to all kinds of things. So reinforcement learning works well for games because games, the world is very simple. You can simulate it very quickly. You can you know, crash your car 50,000 times, doesn't matter. Um, and so it works really well. Uh, for Go, of course, it's amazing how it works. It works for, you know, games like Doom. Uh, it's starting to work for games like StarCraft, although it's still very preliminary. Uh, but this whole idea that you should have predictive models is, is very classical in optimal control. There's a few people here working in optimal control. And the way you do an optimal control system is you, you have a model of the thing you're trying to, to control that predicts the next state of the system from the current state and the action you're taking, or the command. Um, and then you optimize the trajectory uh, this way. This, those techniques exist since the 60s. Um, so why, why can't we do this with, with learning machines, basically having our learning machines learn the model of the world? And so clearly the next revolution in AI will be unsupervised. Um, and the concept for this slide comes from Elio Sharifo, is from Berkeley. Um, so, you know, we'll, we'll need AI systems that have, uh, you know, an AI system tries to optimize some objective, it does perception, it, it acts on the world, etc. but inside the agent, you need some sort of world simulator, some way for the machine to predict what's going to happen next. Um, and I'm just going to quickly show you one example of this. Uh, let's see, don't be scared by the fact that I'm skipping over a bunch of stuff. Um, and, and first point, point to, towards a problem. The problem is that the, uh, the, is that the, uh, the, the world is not entirely predictable. So, if you have, if your world consists of two variables, um, y1 and y2, your entire world is, you know, consists of two pixels, and the only dependency between those two pixels, uh, the data points you observe, you know, obey this law. So if I give you the value of y1, uh, you can, to some extent, predict the value of y2. But you know, if I give you the value of, I2, of y2, there's probably two values, or maybe not at all, uh, for y1 that, that are possible. And a priori, you know, I don't, you don't, you're not going to know if you observe y1 or y2. You're going to have to predict the other one from whatever the one you, you predict. What is the, the best way to represent the dependency between y1 and y2? Uh, possibly through a contrast function. So this is you know, the idea of an implicit function. You don't have a function that computes y2 from y1 and another one computes y1 from y2. You have a function that takes y1 and y2 and tells you whether those two values are compatible or not. Uh, so call this a contrast function, an energy function, a negative load likelihood, whatever you want to call it. But it's uh, something that will take low values on the data points and take higher values outside the data points. 
And the animation here describes perhaps what the learning process for such a function would be, right? So it's a function with two inputs, y1 and y2, and it produces a single output, which is the whether y1 and y2 have compatible values. So it's easy enough to train a model to take low energy values for points you show it, but it's hard to actually push up the uh, value for points you don't observe. And uh, a while ago, I made a list of you know, seven different methods to do this, which I'm not gonna go through, uh, be reassured. Uh, I'm, I'm only mention one, which is actually not on this slide, um, uh, called adversarial training. And that's because I think it's uh, one of the most exciting developments in machine learning over the last 10 years, uh, adversarial training. It allows us to learn uh, predictive models under a certainty. Um, so, so here is a, a situation, for example. Um, we have a predictor, the predictor looks at the past, so it looks at a segment of video, for example, it's trying to predict what's gonna happen next, right? So that would be a good way for a machine to learn intuitive physics, for example. So let's say I put a, a pen, uh, I hold a pen on the table and I tell you I'm gonna lift my finger, you can predict that the pen is gonna fall, but you can't really predict in which direction if I, if I do it right. So the way we're gonna build this uh, system is that the, the, the predictor is gonna make a prediction and to make this prediction, it's gonna have access to a source of random vectors uh, called Z here in this case. And so it combines X and Z, run this through some neural net and makes a prediction for what the world is gonna look like half a second uh, in the future. And we can train the system because we can just let time pass, observe the result and then you know, train the machine to produce this. Problem of course is that if the machine predicts that the pen falls to the back and to the left and what actually occurs is the pen falls to the back and the right, the machine was not technically wrong. It was qualitat you know, quantitatively wrong, but you know, it produces the wrong picture. But you know, it kind of predicted the right thing. So how do we tell it, okay, you did it wrong, but really I'm not gonna punish you for it. So what you'd like is uh, among the set of all possible futures represented by this red ribbon here in this, the, the space of uh, predictions, uh, you'd like to tell the system if you made a prediction that is on the red ribbon of plausible futures, I'm not gonna punish you. Even if your prediction is different from the thing that actually occurred, it's only if you make a prediction outside of this red ribbon that I'm gonna punish you, okay? I'm gonna make you pay in the objective function. Now the thing is, you don't know what this red ribbon looks like. So the idea of adversarial training is you train a second neural net to learn the location of this red ribbon. And it's, you know, it's very much like this contrast function I was telling you about earlier. And uh, the predictor is actually used to produce uh, hypothesis samples that the other one is gonna tell whether they're real or not. So that's the idea of adversarial training. Uh, the, uh, this contrast function, the, 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 the neural net that predicts this func contrast function is called discriminator. Uh, and we have a, uh, a generator that pr makes predictions. So initially the generator makes bad prediction and we train the discriminator to produce a high output, high energy output. And then we show the discriminator what actually occurred in the world and then we train it to produce a low output, okay? So the discriminator basically learns the contrast function between things that actually occur and things that for now don't occur because they're predicted by the generator which initially doesn't do a good job. Simultaneously, the generator gets the gradient from the discriminator and so it knows how to change its prediction so that the discriminator will think it's real, okay? So as we train the discriminator, the discriminator learns this contrast function, and as we train the generator, the generator trains to produce those green dots closer to the real dots and learns to do good predictions. That's the basic idea of adversarial training. You train to network. So it breaks all the things we do in machine learning because instead of now minimizing an objective function, we try to find an actual equilibrium between two functions, one that is used to train the generator and the other one used to train the discriminator. Uh, and, you know, that turns out to be a lot more complicated than minimizing functions. So people are working a lot on trying to make this process stable, essentially. Um, but when you manage to make it work, uh, it works amazingly well. Those are non-existing bedrooms that were produced by a generator that doesn't actually look at anything other than random vectors and is trained to produce images of bedrooms. Um, and so those are randomly sampled images of bedrooms. Um, this is uh, work from a few years ago uh, Sumit Chintala is, is at Facebook. Uh, the other guys are at Google, I believe. Um, um, there is a huge amount of progress there. I'm only showing you kind of early work on this. And uh, these are, this is trained on ImageNet, so you can't re actually recognize the objects. Uh, these are trained on dogs. You can't, you know, these kind of funny dogs. 
more recent work on adversarial training by various groups uh, across the world have produced images that are kind of amazing, high resolution megapixel images of faces that are incredibly realistic, uh, trained on celebrities, so you get a non-existing celebrity that kind of looks nice. Um, uh, this is work at NVIDIA, I believe. Um, this, I mean, there's a lot of really, really uh, cool work there in this area. Uh, but we are interested in using this for modeling the world. So if you use least square to train a convolutional net, let's say, to predict the next frames in a video, you get blurry prediction because the, the system cannot really predict what the, you know, what is going to happen in the world. And so it produces the average of all the possible things it thinks might happen, and that's a blurry image. Uh, so that's the, you know, least square or, you know, traditional uh, uh, criteria produce the kind of results you see at the top right here. Uh, but if you use a bit of uh, adversarial training, you get much sharper predictions, which may or may not be right, but they look reasonable. So those little animations, there are six fr uh, frames. The first four frames are observed, and the last two frames are predicted, indicated by the red uh, contour. And you know, the predictions look okay. Um, uh, these are video segments shot in uh, various uh, New York apartments, and as the camera rotates, the system has to invent what the apartment looks like. And so it, look, you know, it figures out what the bookcase is supposed to look like as the camera turns, and the couch is supposed to continue, uh, you know, that there are pictures on, picture frames on the wall, things like that. Um, more interesting, if you work on self-driving cars, you'd like to be able to predict what the other cars next to you are going to do before they do it, so that it will allow, it, allow you to drive defensively. So these are examples, again, uh, a few frames are observed, and then you predict three frames in your future uh, that are spaced from, a th uh, I think, a sixth of a second apart. Uh, so you predict half a second. And the system predicts that, you know, if pedestrians uh, start crossing the street, they're going to keep crossing the street. If a car starts turning left, it's going to keep turning left. The scenery is going to keep moving. So um, slightly more interesting with a model that uh, I'm not going to explain. Um, here's a little video. So this is a, uh, a, a little game. Uh, the, the paper is going to be on, ar on archive in a couple of days. Uh, this is a little game where uh, you pilot a spaceship and you're supposed to go to one of those colored space stations and there is you know, a planet with gravity and uh, you, know, you, you don't have enough thrust to actually uh, you know, go against the gravity so sometimes you crash but you have to figure out, you know, the system has to figure out the trajectory. And what it does is that it builds a model of the dynamics by just learning, observing what happens, um, you know, with sort of various uh, random actions. And then uh, it uses this model to do planning. Uh, so it's, you know, very similar to what people do in system identification and optimal control, except here it's, everything is learned with a, a neural net, essentially, or a current neural net. Uh, and this works much better than sort of classical reinforcement learning methods that require on the order of four million interactions with the environment to get anywhere and don't actually work very well, whereas this system, you know, with 800,000 actually works uh, okay. Okay, I'm gonna stop here and uh, thank you for your attention and take your questions. Thank you, Johan. Since we have you here, I was wondering if you could comment on max pooling operation and the work of George Hinton in terms of capsule networks and see if you could comment on when it's good to use max pooling versus capsule networks and going back and forth, basically. Right, so there is this new uh, uh, paper, recent paper by uh, Jeff Hinton and uh, a couple of his students on something called capsule networks. And it's a, you could think of it as a new type of convolutional net where the pooling is replaced by another operation that is kind of more explicit and tries to uh, essentially directly manipulate the geometric parameters of parts of objects into objects. So um, um, normally in a classical convolutional net, you, you do max pooling. So you, you take the response of the filters over an area, you compute the max. Uh, and you could think of this as kind of a switch that chooses one of the activations. 
Um, there are other types of pooling that people have used, but uh, capsule is a particularly sophisticated kind. So, so far it's been demonstrated that this works really well on things like MNIST when you have a lot of, uh, where you kind of need a lot of invariance to recognize uh, handwritten digits. It's not been really demonstrated on large data sets like ImageNet, or at least it's not been demonstrated as being particularly useful. Uh, I don't think the experiments have been done yet. It's a little difficult. So uh, it's, it's a little up in the air whether this will really change the way we do things or whether this is sort of an interesting uh, idea that needs more maturing. Uh, Jeff has had ideas of this type for about 30 years almost. Um, Rich Zemmel, who was a student with him back in the late 80s, uh, actually worked on a model called Traffic that had a kind of a similar idea of explicitly manipulating coordinates of parts of objects. I think they applied this to like constellations or something, recognizing constellation of stars. Um, and, and so, you know, it's taken him quite a long time to figure out how to sort of reduce this to practice to something that actually works on the NIST. He had an earlier paper four years ago on, uh, you know, some version that wasn't nearly as good. So I think, you know, it's gonna take a while before, before we figure this one out. Okay, I don't think we have time for any more questions, but Jan is gonna spend the entire day with us. And so she, if you would like to say a few words. Okay, well, uh, th thanks, Jan, for that enlightening talk and what is arguably one of the most uh, exciting areas of research today in ar artificial intelligence and its applications. Um, also, as a colleague uh, in electrical and computer engineering, so you're affiliated with our department and on behalf of the Tannen School of Engineering. Um, I just have uh, a couple of other words to say. One is I would really like to thank Anna Koromanska and Rachel Thompson, who's here somewhere in the back, they put an immense amount of effort to put the series together. And so I'd like to thank you, Anna, in particular, and Raquel. Yeah. And for those students, or as to make a very bad joke, I would say whose supervised learning we are in charge of. <laughs> we are, uh, you know, I hope you take the right takeaway that this combination of mathematical insight, uh, uh, data, computing power, uh, and good co coding skills on your part can lead to immense benefits. So please keep that in mind, and of course, very hard work. So uh, as we saw from all the presentation today. So again, thanks, uh, Jan, and uh, thank you very much. And we have this uh, uh, plaque for you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Yeah, nice talk. I'm going to see a sweet clock, okay, now. <laughs>